awesomeness. And uh, Father, we just ask that we would glorify you this morning throughout this whole day, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. to fear now for I am safe with you so when I fight I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high oh God the battle belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet I'll sing through the And if you are for me, who can be against me? Yeah. For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. Thank you, God. You see an empty tomb. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs. To you, Almighty Fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing to the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Amen. Amen. Yes, Lord, the battle does belong to you, and we thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. God, thank you.
for how good you are. You're just so good. Your provision, um, the way you just take care of us on a daily basis, God. We thank you for your love, your faithfulness, and and even your word says that you're faithful when we're not. And we thank you so much for that faithfulness. I pray for all the ladies that are here today, God, that you would touch their hearts in a mighty way, that they would you would meet them right where they need it. Some people are on mountaintops, some in valleys, but you're right there in the midst of it all. And we thank you for being on the throne, God, and that you're in charge. And we choose you every day, every moment of the day, we choose you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Give him praise this morning. We praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. jumping jacks <laughs> felt like a Zumba song so how's everybody this morning amen um, welcome again uh, Kathy's gonna speak to us this morning and um, I'm so thankful you all are here and we're gonna examine ourselves and uh, I'll read something a little bit later on uh, that Kathy was talking about and God showed me an article that I had read many years ago, and it just goes so well with what you're talking about. So come on up, Kathy. Ooh. Oh, my not, I'm on? OK. Well, good morning, everyone. Did everybody have a chance to do their little assignments last night? 
<laughs> okay. I'm not collecting them. It's okay. Don't get nervous. <laughs> I'm not grading them this morning. No. <laughs> On the act, the action that I took and the book chapter. Oh, okay. That one's a tough one. I told you guys it was. I, I sat down and did, you know, I did it myself, and I was like, "Do I live my? I thought I lived my Bible. Oh my gosh!" But you know what? It really did show me that a lot of things that I do, I'm not thinking scripture at all. And I wanted to clear something up when I was talking about that yesterday. I don't necessarily mean like, oh, I'm going to the grocery store to get french fries. Let me see where the Bible verse is about getting french fries. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about as I walk through my day, I'm like, I'm going to the grocery store. Lord, there's people, there's souls at the grocery store. What do you have for me today? I'm going to work, you know. Go ye into all the world, right? Preach my gospel to every creature. There's scripture. Having a verse for my marching orders. And I think I skipped a slide. I noticed last night I skipped a slide. Uh, the slide that said, um, uh, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Did you guys even see that? I think I, skip, I, think I skipped the, I did, I didn't talk about it. Um, and then, uh, you know, tons of those verses and uh, Psalms that talk about every step, it's ordered in his word. And so, you know, as I'm walking, a step is walking. You compare those words in Scripture, it, it just uh, defines for us that as we walk through our day, there should be, a, be Scripture for our motive, for what we're doing, why we're doing. And um, the more Scripture we get for what we do, for every action, every thought, the more in tune with God's Spirit. And I think we kind of, that's kind of recap of what we talked about yesterday. That's really the Spirit-filled life that's being led by the Holy Spirit. The more verse, the more scripture I have for every thought, every feeling, when we filter our feelings and our emotions through God's Word, He refines us and He uh, leads us. <clears throat> and we participate more in His purpose for our lives. The less we do that, we're just kind of like doing our own thing and we pull God out of the box on Sunday morning and on Wednesday night we come to church and then we're aware of him, but then we put him back in the box and off we go. And there's no spirit-led uh, life and we're kind of missing out, um, one, on a great walk and a, a great um, realizing or uh, experience of God in our lives each day. And we're missing opportunities, truly, uh, of ministry because he, he can't get our attention to notice this person or that person or a need or a situation that we need to address uh, that could result in uh, someone getting saved or someone sharing God's word with them that might help them. And that's the whole reason we're left here um, on this earth. And uh, so, yeah, we're on that slide. Cool. Um, Something I did also forget to mention. A lot of re a lot of reasons why we do this. It's not because we don't want to. It's not because we're, you know, anti-obedient. Um, it's because we just get busy, and um, everything around us drives us to be busier and busier, um, and just, you know, you have a list a mile long. Like, okay, at the end, of, I need to get all this done by the end of the day, and. Uh, Funny story, when I was in Australia, you know, we were very busy uh, trying to plant a church, had two little kids. We didn't have workers, so I was like the Sunday school nursery worker, dash pastor's wife, dash discipler, you know, like everything until we could get some people trained up. I got very busy. Um, he was, my husband was working, was a working pastor, and uh, my father passed away uh, while we were on the mission field uh, where he got cancer, and it was kind of a long, for those of you who have experienced that, it's a long, I hate the C word, um, but um, all that was going on, and I started to, uh, oh, not be able to swallow, and just kind of have, I'm like, oh, there's like a lump in my throat, so I go to the doctor and everything, and, and um, <coughs> he does like, well, we're going to do endoscopies and find out what, blah, 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 anyway, um, long story short, he brings me in after it's all over, and he starts asking me all these kinds of questions, like, are you a working mother? Uh, how many kids do you have? And he's on and on, asking me, what are, describe to me your day. And I'm like, what is, what do you, 
well, the more questions he asked, I was like, oh, I see where you're going here. Um, you know, a lot of things can cause us stress. And I was like, I'm not stressed. I love what I do. I, I did. I was not unhappy. I was like, I love, I like 90 miles an hour. This is awesome. Like, you know, this is, this is how I do life. This is how I roll, dude. What are you talking about? He's like, Mrs. Bond, there's no lump in your throat. And I'm like, yes, there is. I can feel it. I can't swallow. And he goes, no, that's stress. I'm like, but I'm not stressed. I'm really happy. I love what I do. I, I, then I was embarrassed because when he asked me what I did, I was like, well, I'm the pastor's wife and we're missionaries. And I'm like, oh, this is bad, isn't it? I'm In my head, I'm thinking this, like, this is probably a lost doctor. And he's telling me I'm stressed and I'm telling me I'm happy being stressed. You know, serve Jesus. He'll stress you out, give you health problems. Want to get saved? Great. You know, and so... I just was so convicted, and I, I was like, okay, I, I understand what you're saying. He goes, I, what I'd like you to do is just pay attention. If, I mean, if you don't believe me, he goes, here's the films. There's nothing there. And um, uh, what will kind of clue you in is pay attention to how you're eating. I think you'll find that you're gulping your food, and you're not chewing, and you're just uh, breathing uh, fast. And so anyway, I'm like, doctors. Anyway, I go, but I was embarrassed. I went away, and I started, pay, I did go ahead and do what he said, and I paid attention, and he was right. I was not chewing up my Happy Meals that I love. <laughs> Drive through, <laughs> gulp it down, go pick the kids up from school, back to, you know, blah, 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 just fast, fast, fast. And then that really, God really got a hold of me there, that, you know, you're so busy, you're not walking with me, you're throwing your food down, you're going to get your kids, you're, you're doing all this stuff for me. I was a disciple, I'm teaching people the Bible. And you know what, you know that verse in Psalm 77, 6 that says um, about being still and communing with your own heart on your bed. Well, I didn't do that. I don't have time to do that. Like, I don't have time to walk with God, I'm serving Jesus. I mean, that's really what we say. <laughs> I don't have time to read my Bible, I'm serving Jesus. I'm busy out of church, I don't have time to... It just and so and both my daughter and I are like this and she comes by it honest and I don't know who to blame great grandma great 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 grandma I don't know it's passed down in our family we're just very like everything has to be done perfectly when I decorate the Christmas tree I will let the kids put their cute little ornaments on the back side <laughs> but my decor side is on the front you know I mean, it's terrible, and it just kills me. Like, oh, it's so cute. They worked really hard on that. And I'm like, okay, here. You know, but it's just like that kind of perfectionist mentality. So I have a list that I need to get done during the day, and I felt like not, not like I had done my best if I didn't get to the bottom of my list every day. I was like, oh. And I, I wouldn't say I was consciously doing that. It's just how I'm wired. And so at the end of the day, um, I'd be stressed out because I didn't get that done and it's hanging on my shoulders and then, okay, I gotta attack that tomorrow. And then over time, turns out, stress has a longevity compounding effect, I don't know what it is, it's like some fancy term, effect on your body that over time, your mind can be happy and your body can say, this isn't good for you. And it will start to react and you'll start to have health problems. And you'll say, well, it's reflux, or it's, uh, I don't know, all kinds of things, high blood pressure, all kinds of health problems. And you'll go to the doctor, and you'll treat that symptom. But the underlying symptom is the lifestyle. And, um, and we struggle to realize that. And um, that's kind of what's really important about this examining and slowing down and communing with your own heart. But I personally felt, and both my daughter and I have struggled with this, um, she actually ended up uh, being diagnosed with fibromyalgia because of this. And if you know anything about fibromyalgia, they say, oh, they don't exactly know what causes it. They kind of have studied different things uh, and think that they see different patterns, but they also don't know how to cure it. They'll just manage it with meds. And uh, we were mystified. And at the same time, I was like, anytime you see something where they don't know what causes it, my, and, and they don't know much about it, I start digging into my Bible because I'm like, all right, well, God does. And we started talking. And sure enough, same as, you know, apple doesn't fall far from the tree, 
uh, perfectionist, wanting to serve God, busy, doing all kinds of things. And, and she's like me on steroids. It has to be perfect. And she wants to please God with all... Oh, sorry. She's a warrior. She wants to please God with all her heart. She will go to the end of the world and put herself through all kinds of physical pain to serve. And we... And that it was not physically right for her. And we spent time talking. I didn't even realize as a mom that she was like this. Sounds terrible on me, doesn't it? But she's not a talker. I'm a talker. My son is a talker. Caleb and I are like, blah, 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 blah. All of our thoughts are out there, out of our mouth. Kaylee is like her dad. You know, deep waters. Draw it out. It may take forever to draw it out, but you have to draw it out. It's in there, but they don't verbalize it. And so she was very much like that as a teenager as well. And I didn't realize how much, how her thoughts were so much on performing and doing and serving uh, to the detriment of relationship with God. And props to her for how much she served, but it started to affect her physically. And so we started working on these principles that you're going to see today about bringing every thought into captivity, examining. And as we did that, we found out she was like, well, I, you know, mom, the verse about present your body as a living sacrifice that's holy and acceptable unto God. That's my reasonable service. Why wouldn't I do everything for him? I'm like, okay, doing, but what about being? What about spending time with him in quiet? You know, that counts just as much. He smiles just as much when you're quiet with him and in his word as when you're doing all these things for him. And so what our plan was, you're quitting all of your ministries. You're out. You're not doing any of this. You're going to get back with a relationship with God. I just want you to read your Bible. I just want you to read and let him love you, and I want, I want you to live, believe that verse that he loves you, that all our righteousness is as filthy rags, and that everything we do is nothing without him talking to us and just that quiet relationship with him. And that was hard work, because that's not, both her and I, that is not how we're wired. We're like, I want to do things. I want to do this. I'm happy. I like doing this. It makes me feel good. But it's not about the doing if it doesn't come, if the relationship isn't there. Does that make sense? Um, and I'm not negating service. I'm saying it's the way we, a balance of that relationship. And it's really easy to get yourself out of balance serving when you're a server and it's really easy for people to take advantage of you when you're a server because they're like, sweet, they love doing this. I don't. Go ahead. And then you do it because you like it, and you keep doing and doing and doing, and pretty soon you're just worn out. And um, you don't even know you're worn out. And your body tells you, enough. You need to stop and because other people need to rise up and help, and you need to slow down. And that's how the body tempers. That's how the body is um, the members work together. Every joint supplies. It can't be uh, out of balance. And so uh, sometimes you get matched up in groups where uh, I call it, it's like uh, codependent. It's really bad. I love doing. I love not doing. Okay, here, I'm idea girl. You're make it happen girl. Make it happen girl is like so tired. And idea girl is always <laughs> Awesome, because they're not doing anything. They're just thinking up ideas for you to go work yourself to death and do. And when you love to go work yourself and do, you think it's great and fun, but your body will just say, mm, can't, you can't sustain it. It can't be sustainable. So anyway, uh, long story short on that, the fibromyalgia, uh, I think it took so maybe 30, 60 days of working on those um, concepts of when that thought comes in that I want to do that drive myself back to communing with my heart, talking with God, praying, reading, uh, looking kind of like those verses that no matter what I don't do, God loves me anyway. 
unconditional love. And after looking at all of those scriptures, I mean, that's been how many years ago? At least five, four, four or five years ago. She, she doesn't have it at all. It's completely gone. I mean, it was nothing more than your thoughts having an effect on your body. And so I know that might sound, mm, like I told you, I'm not that person. I'm not that, like, they were healed. It, it wasn't like that. It's her mind had some thought patterns that were detrimental to her health. My mind had thought patterns that were detrimental to my health. I renew my mind. I start thinking scripture. I start acting on that scripture. And guess what? Your body recovers, your mind recovers, you're renewed, you're transformed. So I just wanted to talk about that slowing down. This isn't something that's quick. It's not the drive through It's not uh, order it up and it's going to change overnight. It is um, day after day repeating what God says to do, having those verses, and it won't be easy. I mean, she told Mom, this is really hard. I'm like, yeah, it is. But you know what? Fibromyalgia is not fun. That is, it's very, very painful. And so sometimes when our phys, it takes that, it takes our physical, some, something to happen to us physically that to drive us to realize that the spiritual is important. And praise God for that. If that's what it takes, then who cares? I mean, as long as you get there, you know? I mean, uh, but yes, I would now, like, probably say, I wouldn't choose that path. I would say I would warn people and be like, watch for it. Don't let it get to that. Um, but there will always be things that God uses like that in our lives. So um, that was the kind of uh, just a little recap of that examine thing. Um, not, I don't want to mis anybody misunderstand this isn't a fast thing. It's a process. Um, you'll start it. It will be, feel unnatural. It is very unnatural because the natural man doesn't like, doesn't dig that. And so it will feel natural in the beginning, unnatural in the beginning. But the more you do it, it will become very natural. You'll start to feel, see, oh, my peace is leaving. I'm getting kind of out of anxious, out of balance. And you'll be like, I need to get back to those scriptures. I need to stop. Maybe I need to stop doing something I'm doing. And we need to let ourselves up from the mat on that, that if I'm doing something. Oh, I don't want to let someone down. Nothing's more important than my relationship with God. And, and your friend or whoever or your pastor or your ministry leaders should understand that, and I'm sure they will, that I'm not doing good. I need to get my balance back. I need to get back into God's word. Because they want a worker that's refreshed, that's giving cheerfully, not grudgingly or of necessity. And if we all do that for e each other and have that grace, then we allow each other to stay healthy spiritually. And it's just so, so important. Um, yes? This is, we looked at the examine verses about how ev let every man examine himself. Uh, this is just one more. A um, little bit different twist on it. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 through 6, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, this is a power-packed, you could be, this verse right here, you could be a counselor for the rest of your life just using this verse. It's really true. You can help anyone, help yourself. There is no problem that can't fit into this verse right here. You take the thoughts or the imagination and then you match it up to the knowledge of God on that subject. And if it's not doesn't match to what God says in his word, you cast it down. And you bring your thoughts or your actions into the obedience of what he does say about it. I'll give you an example. So, for instance, we and I know this has touched a lot of us here, uh, and you guys have been very... Uh, kind about my father-in-law. He passed away. He had dementia for quite a long while. Larry, just, I mean, just not even 24 hours has lost a loved one. Many of you are, uh, I've talked to your uh, nursing loved ones. I know we have some health care workers here. My son is a doctor. He's in the COVID wing of one of the hospitals in our city. And um, I'm telling you, he just, a few weeks ago, he 
mom, man, I, I just, I'm just, it's death every five seconds. I'm just watching them go. And it was so preventable, you know, all different kinds of things. They don't know. He will readily admit, we don't know. We're learning about this. It's a new thing. That's why there's a lot of disinformation. They're trying to figure it out. People might be hiding things. They might not. Either way, it, there's a lot of unknown. But it doesn't change the fact that people have been exp seeing an, a lot of death. He's seen it all day long. I have just a special appreciation for our health care workers now just because I have a family member in it. And when they're seeing it all day long, it's a lot to process. It's not something that all of us, we don't deal with that amount of death in a single day. We might deal with a few deaths in a lifetime, but they're seeing a lot of them every day. And it's really something to process when they have to help the person try to think in your mind, have I done everything I could have done? Were the, and he's saved. So he's like, were they saved? Were they not saved? Did I have an opportunity? Could I have an opportunity to witness to them on their way out? Their family, I've got to go tell their family. It's a lot emotionally. Um, and when we were on the mission field, my, I kind of mentioned briefly, my father, um, he was diagnosed with cancer. You're in Australia. It's so many miles away. The cost of coming back to America was astronomical. We, I couldn't just fly back and forth and check on him. I had to pick the times. I dealt with tremendous guilt about that. Like, I know that God, I, I had the verses of I know that God wanted me over there. And then I'm like, why did you do that? I'm supposed to, like, be there for my dad. I'm supposed to be requiting him. I'm just really, you know, torn about this. Um, and I talked with him about it, and we would have conversations about it. And he was, he was saved, and um, I explained to him how I felt. And, you know, I remember him telling me, even in the hospital, don't you do that. Don't you let yourself do that. I'm so proud of what you're doing for the Lord. I'm so happy that you're doing that. I don't want you to think about what's going on with me. And, uh, you know, no matter whether they say that or not, you still, it helps, but it doesn't solve it. And I just had to go to God's word and get some kind of reconciliation piece about it, which we all do when we, when we experience death of someone. And, uh, I am not being irreverent when I say this, but in is it Matthew and Luke, you remember the young man came and said, I will, I'll follow you wherever you go, Lord. And Jesus turned to him and, and said, come on. The uh, foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he says, oh, well, first let me go bury my father. And do you remember what Jesus said to him? you know, sweet little baby Jesus that all the Southerners talked about, says, let the dead bury the dead. Go and preach the kingdom of God. And uh, I'm like, whoa, that's rough. That's not the PC political correctness that is acceptable nowadays. But for me, reading that, it very much put in perspective, helped me put in perspective what's important in life. This life is temporary. And it's my dad and everyone we know stepped out of this life, which we think is great, but they stepped into a better life. They stepped into a life that if you were to talk to them right now, they would be, stop crying for me. Don't you dare pray me back. That was horrible. <laughs> That's what they would say. And that was what my dad was saying. You know, don't do this. Don't let the devil get there and do this to you. Um, and I think that when we talk about walking by faith, that's how we have to work ourselves through things, is to realize that, yeah, let the dead bury the dead. Go and preach the kingdom of God is what he told him. And by s serving and talking to people about the Lord and about the life hereafter and them knowing whether or not where they would go if they're not sure, that life, that, that spiritual life is eternal. The, the second death is forever. The second death in hell is forever. The death here 
is just, for the Christian, is just stepping out of this life and into the next. And so keeping our minds in a faith place about that subject is a positive thing. And yes, our humanness, we miss them. I will tear up. I still miss my dad. But you know what? I don't, I'm not grieving over that. I'm happy he's where he is. My father-in-law, who thinks that dementia, living longer and in that kind of life is better than being with, if you believe that heaven is real, who thinks that's better to stay here a few more days for me than for him to be with the Lord, get a new mind, a new body, a glorified body? Well, who thinks that? And I know we'll see, oh, but so-and-so went and they had children or they had the, you know what? I'm kind of forced to reconcile with myself. Either I believe that all things work together for good or I don't. Ecclesiastes 8.8 says that we don't have, that no man has power in the day of death. God knew that was the day of death. That was their appointment to come be with him. And that he wanted them there that day. And we don't have power over that. So he doesn't do that to make our lives horrible or anyone's life horrible. He's loving those of us that are left, and it does work together for good. It's us getting, getting to walk by faith to understand what his plan is. And so, so that my emotions and my heart doesn't take me in grief or in sadness so far that I can't follow and see what God's doing, the positive of what God's doing in the situation. That's what walking by faith does. Same thing for the healthcare workers. And I really tried to encourage my son. I'm like, I know this is really humanly terrible, and I'm not in that situation, and I don't know, um, I don't know personally how it feels, but I do know this, that God has something in his word to help you get through this, and you've got to get to it because your partners are going through this too, and they aren't saved. They don't even have a Bible or Christ in their life to be able to help them process this, and they need you to tell them. So when you get it figured out, and you get the verses to help you through this, then you share that with them, and that'll be the thing that helps you get them into heaven. It all does work together for good. So that, that is why I'm like so adamant about this cast down the imaginations. We tend to just go to the worst. I am classic at this. You ask my husband. It's hilarious. I am like this person, well, I just think the worst, like what's the worst thing that could happen? And then when it doesn't, I'm like, you know, hey, cool. I don't know why I'm like that. It's terrible. And I'm, I'm working on it. I've always been like that, just like, oh, probably this and this and this and this, and I'll rattle it off, and he's like, golly, <laughs> fatalistic. And I'm like, well, it could. I just figure if I prepare myself for the worst, then, and, then I'm prepared for everything, right? I don't know. It's stupid. But that's the kind of thing of casting down imaginations where I would have to ask myself, Okay, I imagine that this is going to happen. Oh, they're going to, you know, I imagine some crazy scenario after something's happened. I'm like, did God show me that? Is that in his word? No. Get it out of your head. What are you doing? Now, it's not that we're always going to generate thoughts in our mind because we're human and we're flesh. We don't need to feel bad about that. We're human. We're going to generate the thought. It's what I do with the thought. It's what I do with it. I'm either going to cast it down, I'm going to bring it into captivity, and I'm going to say, is, does the Bible support this? Is this even happening? It's an imagination. Get rid of it. I don't even have to find a Bible verse for that. I don't, it's not real. Get rid of it. You're making this up. You're imagining this in your head, and it's stifling you. So, okay, Kathy, cast it down. Then take the thought, match it up. Is there anything in God's Word that supports this? No. Well, what does God say about that subject? Oh, okay. Well, that is what I'll go with. And then when I get that thought, I will bring it in captivity. I'll be like, nope, that's not what the Bible says. You thought it again, and bring it into captivity. Um, some habits die hard. How to, I don't know why, the, I think when I was busy working, I just got in this habit, you know like door-to-door -door people? They come to your door and you're like, oh, 
gosh, who does this nowadays? It's ridiculous, you know? Like, don't they know we're busy? I'm like, there's the internet. If I want something, I'll dial it up. Anyway, this kid comes to the door, and he's like, eh, you know, he was young. He was really sweet and everything. And it's like, it was a night, like a 97 degree day. And it was really hot. And he's selling solar panels. I guess that makes sense. 97 and, sol- and hot. So he's selling solar panels thinking, hey, today I got up and was like, I think I'll buy solar panels today. Whatever. So he comes to the door and he's telling me about this. And actually, we had talked about maybe, oh, maybe solar is good because we kind of, we have a pool and we're like, that could cut costs. Maybe we could just run the pool on solar, and that, that would be good, blah, blah, blah. I was like, you know what, fine. So he gives me his spiel, and, and, and I guess because of COVID and everything, he's standing back, he's got a mask on. I look at him, and he's like sweating, like he's just pouring sweat. But the whole time I'm listening to him, I'm like, and I can't remember what was going on. If I had the kids there, if I was babysitting my grandkid, I just know I was like in the middle of something, and it was like an irritation to me, you know, I was like, I don't have time for this, and that was in the back of my mind, and then I'm sitting, and he, but I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, we'll do the appointment, how about just call back, though, because I can't, you know, my husband's got to be the one to talk to you, and just call back, make a point, we'll do it, but I just can't do it right now, and da, 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 anyway, okay, fine, I shut the door, and I had been working on this study, and I'd been looking at charity, it's 97 degrees. He's sweating, and I didn't even offer him a drink of water. I'm like, wow, you're hitting it out of the park here, you know? And I, it got me because I just viewed him as just a door-to-door salesman. Like, you're just an irritation to me. I'm like, you know, you could have had charity and opened a door to witness to him. You don't know where that would have been, but you didn't even try because your flesh was just, I got to get back to... I really think I was doing this. I think I was typing my slides. <laughs> and I was like, wow, wow. Well, you perfectly lived exactly opposite of what you want to teach. We do it. And you know where I got that habit? From when I was working. Like, I'm retired now. When I was working, I worked from my office upstairs. People would come to the door. I'd be like, oh, I'm on the clock. I don't have time for this. You know, back to my computer. And you get in, I got in this habit of thinking that I don't have time for door-to-door people. And I didn't think about ministry, ministering to door-to-door people then because I had people at work I ministered to. And when I was at work, yeah, I'm walking with my verses. I'm talking to the, I'm zoned in. I'm walking with God and talking. I really did because I worked on that previously. Well, now I'm retired. I don't have that ministry anymore. And now there's very few people that I, you know, your world kind of shrinks when you retire. You, all the ladies that you knew at work, you don't, you know, they're all retired to the lake or gone somewhere, you know. You know, I don't see them very much. My ministry um, contact list is definitely shrunken. And I'm like, I could have really used an opportunity from a door-to-door salesman, you know. I mean, because I don't make contact with that many people anymore. And, and I'm like, wow, you're not, you're not in the habit of this. You're still living like your old self at work, your work self. You view work people as the lost people at work as your ministry, but you never viewed door-to-door people that way. And now God's showing me, hey, the grocery store lady, the door-to-door salesman, those people, they're important. You know why? They're the only people I see other than my grandchildren. I mean, I I don't, you know, wherever I go out, that's what I see because I don't go to that job with all those people anymore. So God's still changing me. It's still refining. It's the same principle. It's just I didn't recognize it because it was in a different scenario. It was the door-to-door salesman. I learned how to walk by faith at my job with the girls there, but I never, th- I, I wasn't doing that with the random strangers that come across my path. And, you know, it just really got me. And so it's always a process of learning. We'll walk through different things, whether it's deaths or salesmen or whatever. It's just souls, and our perspective is what matters. And so with all of that, how do I view it? What is my imagination? What are my thoughts? Let's, let me look at it. Let me, and, you know, I'm thankful that I was abiding with God to where he, as soon as I shut that door... It was like he was sweating. It was like, I don't hear voices in my head. I'm not saying that. It was like, I'm talking with God, and I'm examining myself, and I recognized, you, you could have 
you know, that verse came to my mind about if thine enemy thirst, give him a drink. Like he was, I'm like, wow. One, he shouldn't have really been my enemy because he's probably not even saved. And two, even if he was, I should have given him a drink. It's those little things like that. But it's funny the things that God will bring back to your mind to just sh- snap you back into, hey, you know, what's, what's our purpose here? So, again, just another verse of how to walk with Scripture, think with Scripture. And the last part of the verse, having in a readiness, that's not the end of it, having in a readiness to, re- in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when my obedience is fulfilled. So I'm not changed, I'm not revenging disobedience until I do the right thing. So I take the wrong thought, I match it up to what the Bible says, great, I know now. Awesome, oh, I should have done this. But you know what? It won't be complete until I face that situation again and I do the right, I do the Bible verse that time. When I do that, then my disobedience will be revenged and I will start, it will become, start to become the, the right habit then. Does that make sense? That it's the action, uh, doing the right thing. Uh, knowing uh, doesn't really do anything. Um, there's this verse, I thought I wrote this down somewhere. Um, it's back there in James where he's talking about, uh, you say you have faith um, with works, and, I, and he says, I'll show you my faith by my works. And then the verse r- right after that, and he says, thou sayest thou believe in God, but I'm going to show you, I believe, but I'll show you my faith by my works. And the very next verse says, and the, dev- the devils also believe and tremble. So like the only difference between us and the devils in, in the context of those verses is that we believe it. We see what the Bible says. Oh, I believe that. I believe that. Yep, that's right. That is right. The devils do that too. In fact, they even tremble, it says in James 2.19. They tremble about it. They know it's right. But you know what the difference is? They refuse to do it. They don't do it. They are in rebellion to anything of action of doing it. And when we do, when we know it and don't do it, we're aligning ourselves with the wrong team. They believe and tremble. We believe the difference maker for us is if we do it. And I don't know, that really impacted me because I thought, okay, there's where the rubber meets the road because they believe, you believe, the difference is, are you going to do it? Are you going to act on that scripture? So, yeah, imagination's proof. Did it really happen? Do I know this for sure? Is it imagination? Cast it down. Are my thoughts and actions based on scripture? Is, do I have scripture for the way I think? My opinions, my ideas. Is it sin? Might not be. But, you know, all things are lawful, not all things are expedient all things edify not. Is it edifying? Then maybe I should look at the scripture for what is edifying. Obedience. Uh, We kind of already talked about this, but we find out what the Bible says to do. Obedience is fulfilled. That's when, that's the difference maker, is the obedience part. Repeat. When we do that process over and over, and then we repeat it, there is your transformation. Just like we talked about examining. We examine and we, and we see what you know, needs to be changed, what God says, and we repeat it and repeat it. And you know what? Over, over time, that becomes our nature. Charity. We repeat charity. Where our thoughts wrap around that, and we'll get those definitions. After today, when we look at all that, God will be able to bring all those things back to our remembrance, and we will start the process of being charitable, brotherly kind, um, virtuous, knowledgeable, and repeat. But this is the path. This is the mechanics of how we do it. And then that is result in renewal. That's what being renewed is. is uh, that's repeated, and then we're changed. We're thoroughly furnished from the inside out. He worked on our heart about it because we took those thoughts and we matched them up to what the Scripture says, and it discerned the thoughts and intents of our heart and showed us, here's where you're at, here's where we're going to go, 
now. Let's just act on it. I liken it to the gym, you know? Nobody, well, I won't say that. A lot of people like to go to the gym. Raise your hand if you just love to go to the gym. Oh, really? No. Oh, I'm in good company. I hate going to the gym. I don't like to go to the gym, but I go to the gym. I struggle with the gym. I'll go like, you know how you go months, and, and people are like, well, we should go to the gym. My daughter will say, Mom, we should go to the gym. I'm like, yeah, I know. I know I need to go. And you know, you just have to, like, your mind's not there yet. You know you need to go, but you just can't make yourself do it. And here's how I, I can get myself to go to the gym. All I have to do is go shopping for a bathing suit. <laughs> go shopping for a bathing suit. Try the bathing suit on in those stupid, weird mirrors. I swear they do something strange to those mirrors, you know. And then I'm like, oh, my gosh, i got to go to the gym. <laughs> That will get me to the gym every time. Maybe I'm just totally vain. But I get to the gym, and then when I'm, you know, you do it, the trainers will be there. Oh, you're doing this wrong. You need to, you don't have good form. You're going to get an injury. You need to, you know, and they show you some tiny little thing that you're not doing right, and then you do it the way they say, and all of a sudden it hurts like 600 times more because the way I was doing it wasn't working the right muscle or whatever. And then they go, oh, don't, no, just put your leg back here like this. And then, uh, and then it's killing you. But when you're done and you walk out, you're like, oh, my gosh, that felt so good. I feel good. And then I want to do it. I want to go again tomorrow. And, I, and it gets me back in the pattern of it. That's exactly what this is. You do it in the beginning, and you're like, I don't like this. But the more you do it, you will experience life going so much better, walking with God and doing things his way, how he just works everything out, that you'll want to do it again and again. And then it will become just kind of, I should, people like to say second nature, but I'm going to say divine nature. You'll become divine nature. And that's how we're changed. Um, so that's just kind of the process you know, the mechanics of how we would, would do those things. We're renewed in the spirit of our mind. We're conformed. And we've talked about uh, quite a bit of this, of how we're not made perfect by just willpower, but we're made perfect uh, by his spirit working through us. So on to spiritual and emotional maturity. And this is kind of where we're going with these seven virtues. If we don't understand how to walk by faith, because every th- all these seven things are built on faith, it just it it won't happen. It it will be inconsistent, um, and so we're going to add to it. That's the conference goal was to get these things in us, to have these things toward each other. Uh, the body of Christ probably needs these attributes now more than ever before, with the different things that are going on in our world. Um, we probably need more charity than we've ever needed before, um, not only to the lost, but for each other. Um, there's just so much uncertainty, I guess, unrest in the world, not in Christ, but in what's going on around us. And uh, it is very easy. I find it easy. You listen to the news and, ah, you know, like everything is, your hair's on fire, the world is ending, you know, it's just... Fear, fear, fear everywhere you turn. It doesn't matter what side of an issue you're on. There's some fear factor to it. And uh, that's by design. It's not by God's design. It's by the enemy's design. And um, we just walk through this world. It is uh, hard for us not to let it affect our emotions. Uh, Very hard, unless we're in God's word. And sometimes we just need to turn it off. It's just not edifying. Um, so these seven things, we'll kind of go on. We've talked about faith a lot. I don't think we're going to spend too much time on that. Uh, you know, the, this, these verses are verses I've already kind of given, um, other than James, um, where in James 2.17, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show you thee my faith by my works. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? And that's the exact passage where he says, even the devils believe and tremble. And so we, we, I'm not downplaying works, but we can do a lot of Christian things and not have faith attached to it. If someone were to say, well, why do you have Sunday school? You know, you don't have to have Sunday school. 
It's not in the Bible. Now, is it biblical to teach children God's word? Yes. Well, who's supposed to do that? The Sunday school? Parents. We take a lot of things, on, and I'm, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Sunday school. We have Sunday school, but the pressure that we put on ourselves to have a perfect Sunday school, to do, uh, you know, the rigor that we put. Um, I'll pick on worship. Worship, and we think it, and in today's uh, climate, we think of worship as music. But if you study the word worship through the Bible, it does. it's not music. The Old Testament, they worship God with music, but like, you don't find that anywhere in the New Testament. He that worships God worships him in spirit and in truth. Truth is God's word, Holy Spirit. You speak to yourself in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Nothing wrong with praise. Nothing wrong with music. I'm a music major. I love music. I, I love it. I love all kinds of music. I love Christian music. I love secular music. I love all kinds of music. But where I keep my head about music is that right where God puts it. Not before his word. Not before a walk with him. And so it's just perspective. But it's important to know from scripture what is important and how to walk and where to put our efforts. Because there's only eight hours in a day. And there's only seven days in a week. And there's only 30, 31 days in a month. And we have a lot, you know, we have to choose um, where we put our priorities. And spending time with God is at the very top. And then there are maybe family, marriage, things like that. But we have to put them in order. And it is very easy to get busy in a project of something, busy in church work. And I have done it. I told you the example of it and ended up in a doctor's office. And I had to just... We went away for a weekend, and we just scrapped everything. We paid the kids 20 bucks a piece. We told them, we'll give you 20 bucks if you can be quiet for two hours. That's $10 an hour. We got them games, all this stuff, and we're like, Dad and I have got to sit down and really look at God's Word and figure out what we're going to shut down, what we're going to keep, because our marriage is strained. You know, we are stressed out. We can't do this, and... Um, and they did. They were like, it was so hard. Oh, my gosh. For them to be quiet for an hour each was like, you know, $10? That was definitely back in the 90s. <laughs> they would probably ask for 50 now. But, um, but, you know, we had to do that. We had to do that. It, it was a matter. And, you know, you, in your mind you think, oh, that's uh, maybe well, people think we're not a good church. What if people leave? What if, but you just have to reconcile that, you know what? Our relationship with God and each other is important, and if they don't understand, then they're not walking like we want to walk. And so sometimes that's what it takes. It's our works can get um, outside of our faith, if that makes sense. We're not really keeping priorities. We are, First John 3.18, supposed to love in sincerity and truth. Um, 1 Corinthians 5.8 says sincerity and truth, and 1 John 3.18 says love and deed and truth. So we do the deeds, but the sincerity is supposed to be there. It, it's cool how they swap those verses, um, swap those two words to show that the deed should be sincere, but the truth is always there. And it keeps us, it's to keep us from getting out of balance. So the next uh, so everything's built on faith. We've exhausted that, I think. This is all that makes sense, how we're walking by faith. It's just simply scripture. So if I'm going to be virtuous, then I'm going to need some scripture about what is virtuous. And then you know what? As I live my life from this weekend on, once we have some scriptures about virtue, God will be able to bring those back to your memory if we're walking with him each day and saying, Lord, I'm going to abide with you. Hey, bringing my thoughts into captivity, examining what's going on. And he'll bring these scriptures about virtue. And there's a lot. You can just type virtue in. You guys all know what a, like a Strong's Concordance, like on the phone or uh, Bible search apps. You can just type the word virtue in and all forms of that word. And you will go through the Bible and you'll, that's how I got this. It's not rocket science. It's really easy. Um, but some, I'll just do some highlights about virtue because it's 
a pretty long study if we went through every single one. But Jesus, in Mark 5.30, immediately knew in himself that virtue had gone out of him. You know, the lady touched the hem of his garment, and it said he immediately knew that it left him. That doesn't still doesn't tell us what it is. Um, in Luke 6.19, the whole group wanted to touch him because it said that virtue went out of him and healed them all. And they knew it, so they would touch him, and they, they knew they'd be healed. So that picture is... When a person is virtuous, if you're healing to other people. You're a healing, and I don't mean in a physical sense, but I mean in an emotional, spiritual, friendship sense. They want to be around you. They feel good when they're around you. You just make everything better because you're that healing influence in their life. Why? Because you share God's word. You live God's word. How many people are like that? I read statistics how women just so want relationship and um, best friends. But, you know, I find that in church sometimes it's the worst place. Like I've had better, lo- better friends at work. This is the truth. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to insult you girls that go to church, but <laughs> at my church, so <laughs> forgive me. But um, because I'm a pastor's wife, and I've, had, I've, been in, I've been a pastor's wife in two churches, there's a lot of weird stuff here like, oh, I don't want her to, you know, they won't get close to me because they think, I don't know, they think I'm going to judge them or they think I'm going to go tell my husband that he's going to preach on it next week, which he never has done ever and would never do. But it's just some weird thing in people's mind, like I'm not human and they don't want me to be human because, you know, let's put her up here and then when she doesn't do something right, that's fun, you know. <laughs> Look, she's like, oh. you know, it's like we kind of like to have our punching bags. And so it keeps you from having... Um, close friendships a lot. A lot of times um, being in the ministry is a very lonely place for that very thing. And what people don't realize is, you know what? I struggle exactly the same as you. I just chose a life to try to help people. I wanted to do that. I like doing that. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. It means I'm trying. I mean, I'm trying to be an example, but I'm exactly just as vulnerable and have just as many fears as anyone else. I have just worked hard at trying to get skills to study the Bible to help myself when I get jacked up. That's really all it is, you know. I walk through the world just like you. I dust my feet off after it gets the best of me, and I get back in there. Sorry. (laughs) But um, don't think that your pastor's wives and your leaders in your church don't crave fellowship, transparency, vulnerability. It's the most healing thing. It's the most virtuous thing. And I'm going to be on my soapbox here, but you need to be that. Gosh darn it. (laughs) We want friends too, (laughs) just like you do. It's not fair. (laughs) And a lot of times what we have to do is just go back to God and be like, well, Lord, you know what? They're looking at me, but really who who they should be worried about is you because it ain't about me. I don't care. I, I, don't, I don't answer for you. You answer to him, not me. It doesn't matter what I think. And if you're caught up in that, big mistake. You're worried about the wrong person. Uh, I got enough just worrying about myself, truly, truly. And I'm sure Larry feels the same way. So anyway, that's my little rant. Sorry. Um, healing. Healing went out of him. Uh, the next person, Ruth. Uh, the story with Ruth is, you know, Naomi loses her husband, and then Ruth and Orpah, um, they didn't, do I have this right? Yes, he dies, and then they don't have husbands, and so they're going to st- stay around. Ruth's like, I'm just going to stay, and Orpah's like, I'm not, I'm out of here. I'm going to go somewhere else because I, I want another husband, and Ruth says, you know what? I'm, I'm staying, and Naomi says, I don't have another son to give you. You know, they died. I don't have anybody else. Are you just going to hang around here? For what? You have no future with me. And Ruth says, whether thou, you know, they always have this in weddings. I had this in my wedding. And I think, I don't know if I actually knew the story. I'm like, this isn't about a man following a woman. This is about a woman following a woman. (laughs) But anyway, it's just kind of funny we use that in weddings. Because of the devotion that, you know what? You're serving God. I'm going to stay right here with you. That's that friendship. Like, I don't have another son to give you so that you can carry on your seed. And Ruth says, I don't care. 
And the Bible calls Ruth a virtuous woman um, in uh, Ruth 3.11. But that's what she did. She, at her own expense, at her own loss, for nothing to gain, stayed with Naomi to see her through her hard times. Boy, that's a, that's a friendship. And um, it's really cool. The Bible says that's virtuous. Um, and Naomi was in that affliction for her to do that. Um, then your biggest passage on virtuous woman, it, uh, virtue is Proverbs 31, and it's huge. Um, now, I know, and this is funny because in this is my funny thing. So when you grow up in churches, the virtuous woman is like, you should learn to knit and sew and rise while it's night and fix meat for all your, you know. I mean, I have seen everything, like literally where people like literally did this. The ladies of the church started getting up before dawn and they would start serving meat for breakfast. And I was like, well, then I got to a church that actually taught the Bible um, and showed me that this was prophetic not something we literally try to live, uh, literally, as in get a candle, knit, hold a distaff, you know, all this silly stuff. Um, so it is a picture of the church and what she's and uh, all the different things. And we would not have time to go through every verse and show what it pictures. But inspirationally, suffice to say, it pictures the church and the virtue of the church, which we are to be like that as women. Um, and so just a like kind of synopsis, what I did is I went through Proverbs 31 and just wrote down uh, highlights of what she did. Um, and you know how we looked in the beginning of this conference at that verse in Isaiah talking about, I'm calling you daughters of ease. Like, you know, wake up. We have such a life of ease. Um, just listen to what this virtuous woman is involved in. She can be trusted with a heart. She does her husband good, and that would picture Christ all her life. She seeks. She works willingly. She brings food from afar. Don't think real food. Think God's word. She rises while it is night, dispensation of the church age. She gives meat, God's word, to her house and her maidens, ministers not only to her own house, that's listed first, then to others, considers the field, buys the field, plants the vineyard, girds her loins with strength, that's God's word, strengthens her arms, reaches to the poor, not afraid, makes coverings, makes linen, sells linen, that's righteousness, picture of righteousness, delivers the linen, opens her mouth with wisdom, in her tongue is a law of kindness, she looks well to the ways of her household, and she never eats idle bread. She's busy. It's sacrifice. It's quite a picture. That's virtue. And that, but kind of as you go through Proverbs 31, you'll see the underlying theme of wisdom. Everything she's doing, she's doing with God's word, strengthening her arms, all the things that she's doing. When you look at the typology in that passage, it always comes back to God's word is what she's using. But it's not like, you know, you get saved and I just sit here and it'll just automatically come. No, she would have been participating in that process of renewal. And she was human just like us. She would have had flesh uh, desires just like us, but instead she chooses, okay, the Bible says this, and then pretty soon you see all that she's doing and that's virtue. Um, when we have that kind of virtue, we would be teamwork, wouldn't we? You would be there for your sister in Christ. You would be there for in your church um, for others. Um, I look at what she's accomplished. She's all doing all this on her own. Like, this is pretty independent gal. And um, it reminds me there's a I'm just super inspired by a couple of people that uh, my husband came in contact with. We had worked with some addictions, some people with addictions, and there's a conference in Missouri once a year in Jefferson City, and these people come together that have, uh, they're like halfway houses or safe homes for people in addiction that are, they're clean, but they need a place where they can not be around the influence. And there were a couple of women who had um, been in it 
with addictions, had problems with addictions, they recovered and they got saved. And they are not married. They don't really have anyone in their life because their past kind of alienated their entire family. But they really grew in the Lord, got saved, and started investigating how to set up these homes. And they, are, they don't work together. They have, each have separate homes. These girls got uh, the information on how to set these uh, homes up and turn them into ministries. And they have Bible studies. They have churches come in and help. But they got all of the government uh, grants and everything because there's tons of help uh, to get it going. And they stay in those homes, and they run those homes for women uh, for addictions um, and all, all kinds of... It's not um, domestic violence, but it is actually substance abuse and addictions. And they do that by themselves, single women. And God has just blessed them. They had that vision and just are walking, and what a ministry. They have won so many women to Christ because they come in that home, they give them a place to stay, and then they teach them God's word, witness to them, they get saved, they help them through their addictions, and they did it all on their own. I'm in awe. I'm, I'm in awe of that. But just to think how they had nothing. I mean, they were dead broke because they had squandered everything away you know, um, when they were in trouble with their addiction. But I think it was because of being so low and they're so thankful for what God had done in their life. They didn't view anything as an obstacle. And they just took God's word and, hey, we're going to do this. And now they just have these awesome ministries. And I just think, wow, you know, how many of us just sit around with so much resource, so much time, and do nothing with it? And so they are very much my heroes. When I hear those stories, I just think, that is virtuous. That's a Ruth. That's a Proverbs 31 gal. So I'm going over, aren't I? I got, okay, cool, awesome. I'm paranoid of going to over. Um, the next one is knowledge. Again, this one. This one kind of stumped me a little bit because, like, add to knowledge. But then after I started looking at it and going a little bit deeper, I kind of got, I got what he's saying here. Walking by faith, we've got to have some knowledge of what the Bible says. So I was like, well, we're already, we already get knowledge if we have faith. I mean, we're getting knowledge of what God says about different subjects. So I don't know, why in the world has he got knowledge stuck in here? But you know what? We can never get all the knowledge as we go through life. We experience different things. We have to continue learning about different things because what I, what I experience as a 20-year-old is not what I experience as a 30-year-old and is certainly not what I experience as a 60-year-old. And as I walk through life and the different things that face me as a 20-year-old, I don't have a perspective on grandchildren. I don't have a perspective on menopause. God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody should tell us about that. <laughs> And so walking through some of those things in life, we always have to be adding knowledge, you know, from God's word to help us. And I'm assuming that we will until the moment of death, that we will be working through things in God's word that we didn't really know it would be like that. And, and I can always have this, oh, it's just like, I want to say the word peace, but it's such comfort to me to know that I have a place to go when I don't know what's going on and I don't know what to do. I know it's in there. I just have to get in and he'll show me. That is everything. It's just everything. So this knowledge, just continually going back to God's word. But one thing, um, in Ecclesiastes 7.12, um, and I won't go through all of these verses, but Ecclesiastes 7.12, I love this. Um, it says, wisdom is a defense, and money is a defense. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom gives life to them that have it. So you can be wise, and it will help you defend things. Money can help people defend things. But the excellency of knowledge, the best knowledge, is the knowledge where the wisdom of it results in life when you have it. 
In other words, kind of what we talked about, the devils believe, but they don't do it. In Hebrews, it talks about having your senses exercised to discern good and evil. We can know things. I know things. And I told you guys the stump story. I always knew that verse that he created all things, by him all things consist. I always knew that verse, but now I know that verse. That is, there is a wisdom to that because I'm ex- I'm, I lived it. I lived that through that experience. I lived that verse. When you walk in a verse, it produces something different than when you learn the knowledge of the verse. I know something from the Bible, but until I do it and experience it, I don't really know it. Does that make sense? And so when he talks about the excellency of knowledge, it should result in a changed life. I can know the wart on the Antichrist toe. I can know all of the prophecies about that, about all of the different things. But And they're great, and we should know them. They help us understand the times. But we, shouldn't, we should keep a balance of what is it doing for me in my life? What has changed in me as a result of this knowledge? Because knowledge, the excellency of it is that it should give life. It should give a changed life. It should be make a difference. Otherwise, it's just knowledge puffing up. And so that's something that we just, just a little, I think in my circles, we're very into studying the Bible teach people how to study the Bible. I'm all about, you should be able to turn every passage of scripture and put your finger down and show somebody all three applications and know exactly how to apply it to your life. I am 100% anybody I disciple, when they're done with me, I want them to be able to be able to do that. That skill, they should have that. I'm, I, I believe in it. But it's, like I said, the race, it's just putting your feet on the starting blocks that's all that is. That's basics. That's just basics. What really propels us forward is taking what we know then and, oh, I'm going to live this. I'm going to do this in this situation. That's what's really important. Uh, Philippians 1, 9. I think I've got that one, 9 and 10 on there. Uh, he, Paul says, I pray that your love may abound more and more in knowledge. There's a good example of it. You learn more and more. You should love more and more. The more you know, the more you should love. It should result in more love. Um, If it's not resulting in that, again, it's knowledge just puffing up. It's just knowledge to be impressed people. Or I don't know what, why. It's just no to know. And he's like, that's not what it's about. And in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, we kind of talked about this uh, earlier that passage, the one uh, that talks about in the last days people will be, and then it has that big list, you know, lovers of their own selves, blah, 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 truths, fears, heady, high-minded, having a form of godliness. So they look spiritual. They look very Christian, but they, den- they don't walk in the spirit. They don't walk by scripture. So they deny his power. They don't walk by scripture. But the very last part of that verse says they're ever learning. They're always learning. They're getting knowledge. They are learning all the time. They're impressive. That the one thing, they just are never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They can't make it work in their life. It's not true for them. This, these aren't bad people. These are good Christians. These are Christians who um, I was one of. I'm in high school. I'm doing all the things a good girl should do. You know, my, but my life, I was miserable. I was not happy. I didn't know what to look for in a person to date. I dated every wrong person. Like, it's ridiculous. I was like the magnet for the worst person, you know? And because why? I remember when I finally came to a good church, I, I told my pastor that. I said, man, I've had a string of relationships. These guys, I mean, are there any good guys in the world? Like, it's horrible. And um, he's like, well, do you even know what the Bible says, what you should look for? I'm like, oh, no, does it have that? <laughs> he was like, yeah. I'm like, he was, it's, you're supposed to look for somebody that is like Christ. I'm like, oh, well, there's no one like that. He goes, sure there is. He's like, you, you start studying. He goes, you get in there and you look at the attributes of Christ, so of what Christ is. And he goes, there's, there's guys that are like that. I'm like, oh, okay. 
I mean, how silly. I grew up in church all my life. I just thought, you know, well, there's a, he's a pastor's son. I bet he's a nice guy. He was horrible. <laughs> and then the next guy was a, uh, you know, those youth, um, uh, oh, they're like youth preachers, uh, those youth organizations where high schools come together and they have rallies. It was called Youth for Christ back then. And uh, he was a singer in one of their traveling gospel quartets. He was a really good singer. And he went to our high school. And I'm like, that's it. He's saved. He even preaches. He gives these devotions. And I started, like, traveling around with them and their um, quartet and their sound people. And we were doing concerts in churches and everything. That dude, like, on the weekends was sleeping with some other girl who wasn't saved. Like, he had a complete other life. My senior prom, uh, two days before the senior prom, my friends told me about this for months. I was like, you guys don't know what you're talking, you're just jealous of him <laughs> because he's so famous. You're jealous of him. Like, Kathy, no, we saw him at Shakey's with so-and-so. Shakey's, it's like you go across the state line and they could drink. And I was like, he would never do that. He preaches the Bible. And... Uh, Two days before the prom, I find out, it's true. He had arranged to go on senior week with some other girl. And I was like, <sighs> my mom was so worried about me. She went to see the principal. I'm just worried about her. She's really depressed. And I was like, I don't really, I was sad. I think that was an unnecessary worrying. But anyway, you know, moms, <laughs> like, you went to the principal? He doesn't even know me. I'm like, gosh, stop it, mom. You know? But, I mean, that was kind of the history. My worst experiences were with so-called Christian boys, and I wasn't looking for scriptural guys. And so when I finally got to a church where he's like, man, you need to use your Bible. You need to use your Bible, not look for Christian night. I'm like, oh. But I was listening then. I don't know that I would have been listening before because I was just in my mode of being raised like a good Christian girl. But you have a string of those kinds of events and pretty soon you're open to someone saying, hey, you're in the wrong thing. It's good and it's Christian, but it's not scriptural. It's not spiritual scriptural. I'm like, oh, and I didn't know the difference. I just didn't. And so the excellency of knowledge, we're always learning and we'll, he'll reveal to us and it should turn into change in our life temperance. Let's save that one. Yeah, let's stop, and we'll do that one next. We're going to take a quick break, um, and then when we come back, um, the Hula ministry will minister to us. So, 15 minutes, and uh, see you back in a minute. 